Anything else happening in the uh, world of uh, publishing and publishing translations and all of that that we should be? Uh... Jesus, I don't, I don't know. Welcome to the 3% Podcast. This is Chad Post from Open Letter Books. I'm here with Tom Roberts from Albertine and New Directions. And this week... Um, we're Hold gonna, on, let me stop you there for a I, second. Yeah, I said that and then... Okay, go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, this is not something that like most people are going to... Working in New Directions, uh, focusing all my time and energy and effort into uh, Albertine. Um, so that's that. Sad so, news. So now we have a shorter intro. It's Chad from Open Letter Books and, and Tom from Albertine. Yeah. And Which I'm is back easier. to just being a bookseller. And now I can rave about New Directions books without any sort of, you know, questionable bias. Right. Which is, which is the, actually the topic for today. Because um, we thought that this week we would go over um, the two Reading the World book club books that we had for whatever last month was, February. Um, On the Edge by Raphael Cherbase and then Monospace by Anne Perian. How do you say her name? Marion, yes. Marion, um, like Marion, um, and uh, the on the edge is published by New Directions, and so I don't know what else we're going to talk about in here. And we got zero questions from all of our our, <laughs> our lovely listeners. Um, we did get an early on. We got a couple of responses actually. One was from um, Lori Feathers, who sent in a bunch of uh, comments about about on the edge and then there's one from a guy whose name i'm blanking out on that he posted on the facebook um group about monospace that emma replied to too um but those are the two main responses i got there's a few actually there are people who posted things on the the the, um, facebook page about on the edge but nothing that was like nothing that's like a question for us to address like there was for the last one just more like general thoughts yeah. Um, well, let's start with the cheer base because that's, I think, where you and I are probably more comfortable uh, discussing these things. <laughs> hey, I, I went out of my comfort zone and wrote a whole thing about monospace. <laughs> and I, I look, I don't really read poetry either, and I read an entire poetry collection. Um, <laughs> but again, like I just, I feel so ill-equipped to discuss poetry that it, it, I just feel like I'm, I'm going to be insulting and and and. Yeah. Yeah. I'll please. come back to this, but I read it too fast. I think that's probably my problem too. Um, I'm just, I, there's a specific kind of fiction that I like that is so not poetic that <laughs> it's really hard to get into poetry for that reason, I think. And that type of fiction is like the Cherbase book, right? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I, did we talk about this? Like, you and I were texting, I feel like it was like right after the new year. Um, I don't know why I've got it all jumbled in my head that we were talking, we were texting about college football and um, Javier Maria at the same time. Yes. And uh, that was way too insider baseball for everyone. But <laughs> um, moving on. So we were trying to figure out when the Marias was being published in the US because it is out now in the UK. I just got a, an email from um, the British, the, the London bookstore that I ordered my copy from and it's on the way. Oh, so. sweet. Um, and somebody wrote a review, I'm avoiding reviews, of course, mm-hmm. uh, of the new Javier Marias. But um, I'd been meaning to read the cheer base and, because I knew I was going to Winter Institute and wanted to talk about it and just wanted something. And, and our discussion about Marias made me think, OK, I'm going to read this because it'll sort of be like that. Turns out it's not at all. Yes. Um, it's Spanish and that's about it. Um, I would argue that Cheerbase, we won't know the answer to this. Um, and I haven't really read any interviews with him or, or much about him personally. And he is now, uh, unfortunately dead. So I don't, I really, there's not much digging in you can do to see how, you know, similar his views on contemporary Spain would be to Marius's. But I do think they have a similar outlook on the condition of Spain as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think Cheerbase, and I don't know anything about him biographically. I, I get the impression he probably comes from a lower class um, and has this sort of blue-collar, 
socialist sort of outlook on things, whereas Maria is clearly like an aristocratic sort of background. Not that he acts like that, just it's clear that he knows how to move in those circles. Right. Can I jump in here? So Cherbis so, was born in Tavernes uh, de Valladigna, Valencia, to a Republican family, and his grandfather was a basket maker. There you go. This is all very, this makes perfect sense, right? Yeah, his dad committed suicide when he was four, and his mother worked as a switchman and was eventually detained. I don't know what that means. Okay, yeah. But yeah. So, I mean, and that comes through in their writing, but I do think they, they've, um, they would have shared similar views on um, the direction Spain's uh, political and social um, future is, is headed. Which is to say it's very bleak, right? <laughs> I mean, okay, so... I don't even know where to begin with this book. It's just a massive unraveling of of a disaster, right? I mean, there's there's a plot, sort of. Um, yeah, I think the plot. I mean, the plot's easy enough. Is that like? And I, but I think the plot's almost secondary to the fact that the book is really just about the collapse, the financial yes. collapse. The, yes, it's a plot that's about history, weirdly. Yeah, and about and about like yeah and yeah and like the way that. Um, it's sort of like that. It's got that sort of spiral-like feeling where, like, this horrible things happen that none of these people have any control over. That's fucked their lives, and it just kind of lets all of that fucking just out there in terms of each one of these characters and how it's impacted them. All centered around the main narrator Esteban, who's a carpenter who's had to shut down his. He inherited the shop from his father, but has to shut it down because he invested all of his money in his friend Francisco's not scheme but his building company to build all these condos when the boom was going on and then when everything fell apart that meant that esteban lost everything and so now all of his all of the employees are homeless or not homeless but jobless and just destroyed um financially and and mentally basically and esteban's taking care of his dad who can't control his bladder or anything else and doesn't speak and is basically just like a paralyzed half-living person in a wheelchair um, and that's it. And he plays cards. Yeah, and gossips quite a bit. Yeah. Um, sadly, they just gossip about other people's misfortune. Like, there's, they, have, they have so much misfortune of their own. Every individual, you know, anyone whose voice... Uh, we should probably say that the only voice you hear in the entire book is Esteban's until he channels other people's voices. But it's not set apart the way the book is sort of set up, like he'll be telling a story and then suddenly he's channeling someone's voice, but there's no quotation marks. There's no anything like that. Yeah, yeah, but they're, they're, in a, they're in italics. Um, yeah, but it's hard to tell exactly when that happens. Well, Do those you know? ones, the ones that are in italics tend to be his employees or the white spout. One of them is a spouse of his employee. One of them is his dad. One of them is oh, um, the talking. woman who those takes care are. of him. Yeah, I forgot about those. I sort of I, – I do this horrible thing. I have a friend, uh, David, who um, – this is his, his theory on reading uh, noir and mysteries, which a lot of them start with these italicized sort of three-page codas of, of God knows what. Mm-hmm. And he said he always used to read them and then he'd be like – you know, because it would be like, you know, the, a description of the killer's hand reaching for the gun, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, it would just start at the beginning of the plot. And he said he learned to just never read the things in italics, which oh. is not to say I didn't read the ones in, in, in this book. I did, but I just – I give them – I don't know. For some reason, I just kind of – they were very obviously side things. I love those parts. Really? Yeah, I, because they're like, they're like the real – like Esteban's still like – I mean he's dealing with his own, his own shit and his own guilt and his own like – um, the fact that he's lost everything and he's embarrassed at that card game as they're talking about the guy that's gone bankrupt and he knows that they know that he was part of that, but they're not going to talk about him there and that's sort of that part of it. But then these people, it's just like the pure desolation. Like the one guy who was like, he was a street sweeper and then, or he was like, he was a garbage man. And as a garbage man, you could work overtime, especially when there are parties and tourists. And then they're like, well, we don't want to pay you overtime anymore. So now you're a street sweeper. So it's like, you know, a raise or whatever, but you don't get overtime. So suddenly he's making less money. And so he takes the job at the carpentry part with Esteban and then immediately <laughs> loses his job and is begging for 50, 50 euros or whatever to feed his children. It's like, those ones are <laughs> rough. I shouldn't laugh at them, but I think they're kind of funny. Like they're, I mean, in a, in a, in a way. They're, they're, they're funny in this, like, you know, the, the tragedy of the whole thing is sort of just, it's so overwhelming and 
like it reaches so d- far down, you know, that you think, Jesus Christ, what more could happen? Right. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's why it's funny because it's just like, I, I, how else can you respond to that when it's just one disaster on top of another, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But they, they tend to be like little palate cleansers in between Esteban's. They were that like, single, kind of singular, whatever. I was entranced by the singular. I really loved the way he told stories and the way he sort of mimicked people's voices without truly like quoting them and all that sort of stuff. And I don't know. I, I think the, the way Chirves wrote Esteban is, is really, really brilliant. And he, he does the, the wonderful thing you should do about it, you know, with a, a distrustful uh, narrator or in a, in an odious one at that is, you know, you don't, he, he makes it so you don't quite believe what you're reading, but you still want to hear what he has to say next, right? Like he throws in so many opinions about people that you just have to just like stop caring and believing exactly what he's saying. But at the same time, you're like, well, what does he really think? Like, how do you, how exactly is he going to explain this? What is the next part of this story? And he just unravels things so brilliantly that I don't know. I couldn't, it was like this horrible, horrible train wreck that you just wanted to watch every little detail of. Yeah. And the, 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 and well, I mean, he's, and sort of his channeling or his, his unreliability is just is letting his anger go. So like with um, Leonora, or what, is that her name? Leonora. No, uh, I guess. Um, the, his girlfriend that leaves him and is like, I need to get out of this town. And then goes out with Francisco, one of his friends, who then becomes the big wine critic and restaurateur and all that kind of stuff. And they have like this big successful life. And then she dies and, and Francisco comes back and they, they hang out and play cards as well. Um, like his rage at her and at like she escaped and was like, you should get out of here too. You're going to be stuck with your dad. And he's like, I can't do that. And then like just ends up there um is wonderful i think that that's that's really fun and his he gets to like epic heights with like his kind of riffs on how how everything got how he got screwed over in that whole deal and he's been stuck in olba or whatever it is is that what his name of the city is do you remember yeah olba yeah i mean you look this up it's like a tiny little i did look it up yeah wow it's non-existent yeah Yeah. (laughs) it barely Uh. shows up and like the, the i love that he like lords himself over like his brother who's like you know, this horrible scrounging sort of con man, but like not a very good one. <laughs> and his and sister. And like the, the, right. And then, but it's like his brother brings this, like this whore with them. And like, it's just this mess of a scene. And, and like, he lords over them. It's like, who the fuck do you think you are? Like you've left all these people sort of, you know, without anything because you took this risk and he refuses to own up to it. The only, it, I, it's such a like neat little compact sort of symbolism for all of Spanish society, right? You've got the old man who can't, who's like insensate to the whole thing. And you've got the older man who is about to retire. I mean, how old is Esteban? He was about to retire. Not yeah, he's, he's like 60, I think. Right. So, but you get the impression he wasn't intending to work much longer. And then, so you have those kind of things going on, and then you've got the the immigrants, and there's like you know it's all put together very um, you know you, you've got a, a little bit of slice of life from every aspect of society, right? Yeah, and there is like the sense of like that he took the so part of like him investing the money was that he would finally be able to have something that he could retire on essentially, right? Instead of like continue to work, be like, well, you know, all these other people are making money; it's boom times. Like, I might as well get in on this too. So he has that whole sweet setup of like investing money in these condos that they're also building all the stuff for. So he's hired more people, so everything's going. And then like through no fault of his own, the everything in the the world collapsed. <laughs> Right. And that's the part that like still gets me because I was reading other books. I think I mentioned this in the post I put online. Like I was reading a different book that I'm not even going to name. But um, around the same time that I was reading this, I read part of this other book. And um, one of the reasons I stopped was that the other book had all these things where it was trying to make you feel like this character had had a crappy life. And it was like really contrived. And like these events that would happen to this character that, that where they get a beat up by, bullied by other school kids, things like that. Like bad things happen to them. And it's like, oh, wow, that's really, like, horrible, you know, here's this poor kid or whatever. And then you read this, and it's like, yeah, this seems much more legit. Like, I remember, I mean, that was not that long ago, but, like, when everything bottomed out, people lost a ton, ton of, like, everything. Um, equity, money, all the housing bubble collapses, all that stuff in, like, Spain was rocked. I mean, at that point in time, following this, this the collapse, they had, like, 40% unemployment among, like, anyone under the age of 30. 
Oh yeah, is, it's horrible. Yeah, and like there's, it's not like they, it's not like he did any of this. He was like going along, and suddenly, you know, someone over in the banks pulled a, pulled, did whatever they did, and fucked everything up for everyone. And I like that. That feels like a more realistic. Everything about this book seems more realistically painful and true than like some something that seems very contrived. Like I don't feel manipulated by like the situation. Like his voice or whatever can like exaggerate and expand and like all and ex- and be unreliable in all those ways. And that's wonderful. But like the core pain of it seems much more realistic than so many other books. It's also. I mean, part of that is that he's he's relying on the actual history of it, which we are close enough to to understand and still feel in some way, Um, which I think is a rare thing. I mean, most of the books we know that are, you know, really good um, books about disasters take, you know, some time. This this was written in 2010, not, you know, two, three years after. Yeah, it, it all happened, uh, which is incredibly impressive for him to digest it all and put it into words um, and, and to have it be so far reaching. Um, oh, absolutely. Which, OK, so I'm, I'm kind of skirting around because I don't want to I hadn't said it yet, but this read to me like a war novel. I was going to say I like the fact that it's not about the Spanish Civil War, but it, it actually feels like um, like this could be Hans Falada. Like these are people except actually under, good and li- well living in like wartime germany or like occupation france oh i see what you're saying oh okay it's okay. just like this specter of disaster and human wreckage everywhere and this guy is just trying to like eat today and that's it and like how do you make a go of it with the disaster going on all around you yeah, like the survival aspect and like that there's something that it's outside of your control. That's the thing that outside of the control part that that appeals to me. Yeah, I like that because the, there's so many Spanish books that are uh, do a, or involve the Spanish Civil War a lot. Like that's still so prevalent in the, the imagination and, and like topicality of like Spanish writers. And this one only has it in like bits and pieces. And I like that. Like it's, yeah, it's actually father, so much more contemporary. The father has escaped execution. Yeah, and was in prison. Talk but a little bit about that, but yeah, it's not there. Which I mean, the Javier Marias, the the Your Face Tomorrow trilogy, right? Like, isn't book one just half Spanish Civil War shit being dredged up? Yeah, like I love that book. Don't get me wrong, but it was you know you're slogging through some Civil War stuff. Yeah, and it, I mean, it seems like it always it's in a lot of these books that have been coming out recently. There's a lot of that going back to like what it was like. With the war, I mean, for with good reason, but like, of course, but it is getting to the point where it's like, oh, well, here's something that's not about that. And I, I'm very much into that now. It feels nice to have something other. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, at least with this book, we can't give anything away. There's nothing to give away. Well, I have a question about that though. So the body at the beginning, um, okay, the beginning part, if you remember, the first like 20 pages or something is a different different narrator. Is um, yeah, his to, friend. Um, I think it was one of his former employees. Yes, exactly. Yep. Um, Ahmed Ulali or whatever. Ulali? Yes. And, um, Moroccan, right? Right. And he's, I think he's the one that's like the immigrant illegally working there, so on and so forth. But right. he, he does get referenced later on. Right. And he has his own, I think he might have a, yeah, he gets referenced a few times. Um, they talk about it, but he's at the marsh where they fish. And where he had gone with Esteban a number of times to fish or to to hunt, I guess mostly fishing, um, and he finds the body, and it doesn't reference there what the body, who the body is, and then it goes back in time to twelve days, so that that begins on December twenty sixth, twenty ten, and then goes back to twenty December fourteenth, twenty ten, and ends sort of that section, that second long, long, long section, the Esteban section, with him being in the marsh with I think his dad. Now, is the body supposed to be his dad or him or both? Um, I, I think it was both because I, I think I went back and reread the beginning where they find the bodies. And I believe it's more than one body. It is? OK. I mean, I'm, I'm going to look again right now, but I am almost positive that it, he he doesn't say bodies, but I feel like. Oh, no, no, you're right. Bumps. Okay, here it is. Here it is. Two of the half buried mud coated shapes in the water are clearly there you human go. forms. Shapes. And right? the remains of the third mangled shape could belong to a man who has been mutilated or to a body largely submerged in mud. It could also be the dog. 
Uh, it could be also, it could be the corpse of an animal, a dog, a sheep, a pig. I don't know what that is, but I, then it, I'm going to assume it's both of them too. And that he like <laughs> offs both himself and his dad. That was, that was how I read it. That's yeah. Well, okay. That's what, that's what I was reading too. But then I was like, but was there one, is it one of them? I couldn't. And then I expected the third part to clarify that. And the third part does not. No, no, it doesn't. Um, I feel like, I feel like that's what happened. Um, partly because there's like the whole, uh, who am I trying to think of? Chekhov with the gun. Like, mm-hmm. isn't there a gun in like Esteban's like third sentence? Like, isn't there a reference to like a shotgun shell or something like that? Am I, I totally imagining this? I don't remember. Um, I feel like there's Esteban, noise of gunfire. He is talking about a gun very soon in his monologue. And I feel like it's, you know, the whole thing. If a gun appears, then it must be used, right? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if he just, if he killed himself there or just killed his dad or let his dad die there. I know he keeps talking about, like, we're going to go back to the marsh. We're going to go back to, like, where. Right. The yeah, there's a lot is. of reminiscing about that sort of thing, about that, you know, which is so sad because they, they, they talk about having, you know, these hunting trips and being outside. And, you know, it almost feels like a little bit nostalgic sometimes when he's out there, like, going to the barn or whatever, or going to his old workshop. And, and then to go back to that fucking marsh, which. The way the immigrants had described it sounded just awful. It didn't sound like a nice place at all. You know. Speaking of, you know how many people live in Olba according to the twenty eight fourteen census? <laughs> yeah. How many? Two hundred and sixty three. Oof. It's an area of eight square miles. I mean, there's a lot of these places yeah. in that part of you know in France and in in uh, Spain, just these like tiny, 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 tiny backwaters where everyone's fortunes are tied together. And, you know, something like uh, a crash like this does horrible things. Yeah. It's also what gives rise to the horrible fucking politics that have been popping up all over Europe. I mean, I'm true because everybody talks to each other. And if you get one guy who's a rabid fucking right wing anti-immigration person, it spreads like wildfire, you know, and, really really nasty which is to say nothing of our own political system. yeah i was gonna say i thought that was a good you're gonna go in a different, <laughs> different, nope. different direction there yeah it's like an hour and a half from valencia yeah which is itself sort of nothing but a tourist town right, right. it's a small industry right like the they grow oranges presumably still I they, have would a, think. they have a decent soccer club <laughs> historically i don't think they're that great this year but they're good <laughs> that's a plus yeah, and it's like four hours from Barcelona, so it's much closer to Valencia. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's, or as much as you can be in the middle of nowhere in a, a country that's small, I guess. Um, I don't know. Anything else to say? I think it's it's a, an incredibly readable book for what it is. Actually, yeah, I do have one other thing. So there was one interview. Well, I have two questions for you. I don't know if you know how New Directions came to doing this. Um, I do not. No. Okay. So skip that question. The other one was um, the nation had a uh, review of this that was like, not the, I mean, it was a positive review, I guess. People thought of it as a positive review, but it's, it, the title is On the Edge Gives No Pleasure and ends with the line, is On the Edge Worth Reading? Certainly it gives no pleasure, but it does seem to operate like a psychological health tonic. It has to be swallowed to take effect. It's corrosive going down. You wonder if you had to add quite so much vinegar and horseradish, but after the effect is invigorating. Life might be bad, but you're not Esteban, thank God. And at the very least, you're no longer reading on the edge. If they, they just ended that a sentence earlier, well, you know what? I don't even like that. I hate that fucking comparison. Like, oh, I'm going to read this book because I'll feel better about my own. Like, fuck you. Like, <laughs> is, that, is that really why you read? Like, come on. <laughs> it's so bad to have some empathy for somebody else. You can't just turn it back on yourself and say, I, at least I'm not this bad, you know? Like, yeah, I don't I, – I, I'm sort of baffled by this review, to be honest. Because, like, it, the whole thing is sort of positive, but, like – I don't know. It's like the lines like the narrative consists almost entirely of a rambling, discursive monologue delivered by a 70 year old carpenter, soon to be ex carpenter, blah, blah, blah. He's just lost his business. It goes on. Um, nothing is good. Nothing is tolerable. And nothing escapes Esteban's rancorous attention. Old people jogging have chosen to, quote, risk their lives, which are, after all, already lost and for the most part, part wasted. 
<laughs> which I think those are funny. And then he has this bit where he says, occasionally, and this is where my question is going to come in, occasionally the rant skews comic, and at few, a precious few moments it recalls the anguished hilarity of Samuel Beckett or Thomas Bernhard. Sometimes, Esteban laments, with old men, our feet turn gangri- gangri- gangrenous, gangrenous and have to be amputated. There's the same faint air of allegory as well. Esteban's father sits in the house, mutant, recriminatory, and unforgiving, impossible to ignore, impossible to live with, a breathing, defecating reminder of the Spanish Civil War and the Frank t- Franco dictatorship, which ruined his life. I thought this was, this guy gives us no, sees no humor in here at all. And for me, I thought that there were parts that were quite funny. I mean, not like, not like slapstick. This isn't like watching fucking friends, but it's like, it's funny in the way that he just goes on about it and he like, finds these ways to like characterize the 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 despair and sort of like entropy of human life in ways that are very entertaining. And I, I know that they're going back to Beck and Bernhard, which are fine app comparisons, but it also feels like you've never read fucking anything else. Like do we always if something's funny and dark, it's Beckett and Bernhard. Beckett and Bernhard. It's like pathetic. Um but I it, to me it was like more I think I texted you this that it was more like a saline sort of rant. Yes. And then also like a lot like Antonio Lobo and Tunes, like a lot like Antonio Lobo and Tunes. They have a similar sort of tone. Um, the structures are sort of different, but not entirely, but the similar sort of like vibe. And they're about the same age, too. I think Antunes might be a little bit older. And Turbis is gone now, but, um, but I think they probably came up around the same generation. And at, one in Portugal and one in Spain, but both have like a sort of like that kind of historical and the, the way that that humanity has progressed or what's become less humane in that part of the world um, and sort of rage against it. But I thought that this was funnier. I don't, I don't get like, I don't, yeah, granted this guy's life is shitty, but that doesn't mean that this book can't be pleasurable to read. Yeah, I agree. There's, there's a lot of humor just, and I, I think a lot of the humor is just in his wit. And I'm, it, unfortunately, you know, if you're looking for pure humor, the wit is found in some of the stuff that's really nasty. Um, gossipy sort of stuff or you know the you know the vulgar the vulgar stories that he tells i find you know very entertaining and funny um even as you know that they're spiraling into disaster at some point i agree with you i don't i don't think that that's a fair comparison um just back at barnard like yes absolutely it's more like celine we had a i had a customer in the store the other day i forget what he was buying Genet or something like that. And he told me he needed a break from Celine. <laughs> <laughs> and he was buying Genet. I was like, oh, okay, good luck with that. Um, he said he was reading Celine and uh, he had just, he, he's like, I think the war part is about to end, so I'm hoping it gets better. I was like, <laughs> whoa. Whoa, no, no, not, not going to happen. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, are you finding it entertaining? He's like, it's like, no, it's just, I can't deal with the war stuff. It's just too much. It's like, well, <laughs> don't know what you think you were, you were in for. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, poor person. So uh, yeah, I do. Then the other thing is, did you know that he has one other book that's available in English? No, I didn't. It is called um, Mamoon, and it was published by Serpent's Tale back in 1991, I believe. I just had it open, and I, of course, closed that. Um, Moon, yeah, by Cherbase, and it came out as part of their Mass series um, way back yeah. when, and that's the only other one. But I didn't know that either. We even, I think we fucked up. It's 1993, August first, 1993. It's short, 144 yeah. pages, but um, I don't think we have that listed in our in our um, anthology. I think we might have screwed that up, but I don't think anyone knew uh-huh. this book existed. Wait, it is in Morocco. I was trying to, the the title Moon mm-hmm. is a very Moroccan name. Right. Um, Sounds kind of awesome, actually. It does. That is the worst cover I've ever seen. Oh yeah, good God! No, the, the all those all those masks um, series from Serpent's Tale are, are, are leave something to be desired. <laughs> this one, I mean, it this was one. 1993. To be fair, but, wow. we didn't even, did we even have Photoshop back then? Or is this just like MS Paint? Because like, the, no, I think we were using Quark back then. <laughs> oh my God. And page maker. Um, but the way like Raphael Trevis where his name is and that cover is ridiculous. You can't even see it. It's just <laughs> buried in there. And that font, it's like Times New Roman size twenty four. This is so bad. It's, it's really bad. There's really so many weird. layers to that. So yeah. But it exists. So And it's available pretty cheaply. <laughs> For a dollar ninety three on Amazon. Um 
Yeah, I might actually go get that because I, I, I did like this quite a bit. And I, I'm excited to see Crematorio whenever that comes out since I've read like 20, 40 pages of that and really liked it. It's the same sort of tone, although different setup, but uh, same thing. So I don't have anything else to say about On, on the Edge. Uh, no, I don't either. It's, it's really good. And yes, it's torturous, but beautiful at the same time. I don't know. It's kind of like reading Bologna. It's like, you gotta, you gotta dive into that abyss and embrace it. And, you know, you can learn something about humanity, even if it's not the good shit. You know? Yeah. Not everything has to be always, uh, whatever. Um, I w- so what about Mana Space by Anne Perry and translated by Emma Ramadan from the French and published by La Presse, right? La Press, but yes. La Press. Yes. Um, which is, uh, what's your names? Uh, Cole Swenson. Cole Swenson. Yeah. Um, I, look, we, we are both self-avowed um, non-poetry readers. And uh, I, I, there are types of poetry I can read and appreciate. And I'm um, going to have to admit that this is not one of them. I, we... I like I like you said. I think I read it too quickly. I'm not really good at sitting there and savoring every line. Um, well, let me ask you this. Let's let's clarify here. So Emma wrote a, a long essay about it. You wrote something about it. Neither one of you, I don't think. Did you mention the footnotes? Yep. You did. Yep. I really don't remember that. And then I read it and thought, oh God, boy, why didn't I see this? So the first half, roughly, the first section. First section, but it is roughly half the book, right? Right. The scenery. The scenery is a a sort of, I don't want to say formal poetry because it's not, but it's more formal than what follows. What do you mean by formal? It's just, maybe the language is more formal. It's a more formal way of describing things and more, um, um, I stilted, is that the right word? Like, it's not as conversational as what follows. I didn't think. I, you know, my take on this first part and the footnotes part, and this might be leading in the direction, was that this is more like a nouveau roman sort of thing where, like, she's creating the scene of this garden and commenting on the creation of that scene at the same time, um, which yeah. is where the, the footnotes part come in, which is not a very, like, deep reading of it or anything. But the, the formality or the stiffness that you're talking about, I saw as more of, like, an attempt, like the, the attempting to construct something. Um, and this is the part someone pointed out on... On the Facebook group, what's this person's name? Where is this? I can't find anything. Um, oh, Charles Gable is the person's name. Um, I don't. Who said that he um, he mentioned that the scenery not only has the footnotes, but what he can tell has the most, by far, the most concrete nouns. That there's an obsession of defining the space, and then the concrete nouns go away as the poetry. Right. Goes on. I guess what I was trying to say. So the first part is basically what you're saying that there's the building of the the scene and the setting, and what Charles is saying about the the concreteness of the words. It feels very precise. It feels orderly. It feels like she was building, like you said, a garden and building a way of talking about it at the same time. Correct. Yeah. Then, and of course, you get footnotes because. It's kind of like, you know, stage notes to a play or, you know, uh, script notes or something where or, or editorial notes on a, on a novel manuscript or, or anything like that. Right. So and, and that's what I think the footnotes are. And, and they're they're less poetic They're I mean, there are poetic moments in the footnotes, but it's also a little more structured. Sometimes it's a straight sentence, an explanation, um, a very straightforward ex- expression or an explanation. Then um, it says, you know, I begin again and we get to the second part. And I feel like she has stripped away the scaffolding that she's built up in order to get at the feelings about that which she has built. And she tries to describe it again that way. And that's why you get a stripping away of those concrete nouns. You get less you get no footnotes. You get a sort of more um, free-flowing sort of way of talking about something um, that, even though I'm sure it is, as a poet, just as polished, I think it's meant to feel, as a reader, more directly engaged with the object itself that she's talking about, which is the garden or 
you know, to use the greater metaphor, art itself, right? right. The book itself, yeah. I saw it was like a collapsing between those viewpoints. So this one has like the things like on page 60 where it's like, I give the name compost to each sprout in the pot, times past, obeying the material called raw and green. Like it's more in the flow of the creation thing. I go for, there's a lot of I goes, I do's, like I go for a blend of spit states that are, those now or once good at entertaining and act without any confusion or effects. I reveal, I called, like that sort of like the, is collapsed. And less like the thing that you're creating and the distance from it and more like the, in the moment of the creation. Yes. And I, I feel like she's trying to, you know, tear apart all of that. And I, there was one footnote. Where am I? Page 16. Footnote number 12. It says, and this is after the, the, just the line, the scenery. Oh, okay. It says, call it monospace. Ready for a new day on a new terrain of shapes where many of these fading things will slowly finish up. Just a thought between the condensed interior and the enlarged exterior, the scenery, how to find yourself no matter what, landscape. And so after the scenery, it says, you see that after all, I'm only interested in the world we live in. So why would I preserve the rest of scenery? And I think that sort of gives you a clue or it gave me a clue basically to the rest of the book, which was, yes, we're going to get this formal and I hate using that word, but we're going to get this way of this way of looking at this thing that I've built and way of talking about it. And then we're going to get the more feeling based way and we're going to tear it apart because after all, it's all the same damn thing, right? Yeah. It's all life. Basically the garden outside the garden is still life. What she sees, what she doesn't see is still life. Right. And so it should all be tried to, you can talk about it one way or talk about it another way, but you should, you should mix it all together. Basically. That's true. Yeah, and then the third part, just like, whatever. I feel like it gets even more, um, not meditative, it's, but it's it's more letting go. It's like an experiential sort of way of being in the garden or something. I don't know. I think the eyes start to, they, there's still a lot of them, but they start to they start to take on a more passive role. Like, it goes from, I criticize at the beginning of repetitions, I push, to later on, there's like, I know or I begin, or I can, I brighten. Like, it's a little, I don't know, it seems a little less active or, like, sh- right. uh, shaping. And right. more, it's more like the, um, I mean, I sort of viewed that as, like, when you're in the museum and you, you sort of sit there and you think, okay, I need to understand this in the context, this painting, I need to understand in the context of when it was created and who was the artist and blah, 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 blah. And then you... After that, you try to think, well, do I like it? What sort of emotion does it evoke in me? Where am I? You know, how does this make me feel? What are, what are my immediate gut reactions based on my own sort of experience? And then at the very end, you just sort of have to sit there and think, what's happening to me right now as I look at this, right? It's like these right. stages of sort of trying to – and these different ways of trying to look at things. And these are all very – you know, over the years, and they're still like competing schools of criticism, not just on literary – pieces but you know every form of artwork you know there's these different ways of looking at things and i think to me that's what this is about just like different ways of looking at art and creating and you know how you can build something and it never goes quite the way you want and how you have to incorporate that into what you do the next time and and so on and so forth in which case taking off that could that could it be possible that this index of every single word uh and the what pages they appear on is almost a send up of like the data analysis form of of looking at art that's prevalent in a lot of universities these days, like I, <clears throat> University of Rochester. I mean, I think to me, I looked at that and I was like, it, it is a sort of challenge. Like, here's these things to have at it yourself, kind of thing. Right. You can also look at it as like, here's the the book, the words that she used the most. Yeah. Like arrangement. Right. It's just like one more way of sort of analyzing your own creation, right? Yeah, figure is an example and everything are in here a lot too. Um did you what did the did the no comma thing throw you off at first too? Yes. In fact, <laughs> um I asked Emma about that and um so, I, yeah. I said, so did you eliminate commas where there were some or what's going on? And she said the way she translates poetry is that if there are no commas in the original, she doesn't add them. Yeah. It's um, a- which, I mean, I guess, I mean, that's the way to do it. It's just, it's hard 
for me. And look, in French, it's hard to read things without commas too. They actually use more commas than we do. So, right. I, well, maybe not. I use a lot of commas, but there are some <laughs> writers who just use a lot of commas when you read. Like when you read, they just go on and on and on with these clauses. Um, and uh, I don't know. It seems to me like. The things I've had to translate, just short pieces that I'm always eliminating commas in the process. Well, one of the things that she said in there that, that's pretty interesting is that she did it, that, that's purposely confusing. She tried to make sense of it and rearrange certain sentence, sentences so it would be less confusing. But it was when she was translating the index that she realized that, those, that certain words that she had translated as adjectives were actually nouns. And that changed the way to read the, the book or change certain sentences, um, which is pretty interesting, too. So she yeah. had to go back and fix certain things because she had used one word as an adjective instead of a noun. Yeah. I, I think it's, I'm, I'm actually on the, the page, the, um, the interview you had done with yeah, Emma. Yeah, it was like the three questions. questions. Yeah. The, the no commas thing, and it says here, there's a messy, messiness to it that feels right, but what was really interesting, and then, you know, realized it was indexing all the nouns, while it still remains a mystery to me why exactly she did that to inventory the garden, some parts suddenly became clear to me. I like that she's like, I have no idea why this happened, but this yeah. is an attempt at it. You know, it's, you know we, we talk about this all the time with translators. It's like, you can do your best, but you can't always get inside the head of the writer, and you shouldn't feel that you need to in order to translate something. Yeah, the, the the I think it does help at times, especially with prose, have some interpretive qualities right. going on, <clears throat> and to just you know have a have a take a stance and just go with it. You know, yeah, like, you're not going to truly understand it, but try to get it across in a way that the reader in English can try to suss it out for themselves. There's another thing. Oh, the photo thing. I, I still think it's weird that there the photos there are photos in the original and they're not in here. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it could, could be as simple as a design cost, you know? Yeah, I guess. It just seems kind of odd, like as if that had been one more, a fourth part of this, or fifth right. part of it. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, I don't, is Anne, the, is the poet still alive? Yeah, yeah, she is. I wonder why, she, I mean, if... if if she would have thought they were very important, then Cole would have found a way. And she's a photographer, yeah. That's when they, the whole thing struck me as a little weird. But I wonder if it'd be funny if it just got left out. Maybe we're, maybe we're drawing attention to something we shouldn't. Right. No, no one's noticed it yet. Let's just let that let that go. There is there is this note here where Emma explains for one of Cole's other tra- one of Cole's translation. Cole also translates uh, from the French of Suzanne Doppelt's "Ring Rang Wrong" uh, from Burning Jack Press. Cole quote translated. The photos from the original, taking photos of her own, at least I know that was part of her plan. Maybe she felt it required something like that. We didn't have the time. That's interesting. The idea of translating photos, you know, restaging them or something like that. Kind of weird. Yeah. Which is not only only a poetry press would do that. Of course. Right. It's not unlike the way they like sort of change covers, but not really change covers. Like they just yeah. sort of Americanize them sometimes. Yeah, and this is one of those. We the yeah the PL one is just the normal PL cover, isn't it? Actually, yeah. I don't think it is. I think it's. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure it's just the PL cover. Right? We have it at the store. Well, it's coming up here. Right, I think but... so too. But I thought there was. Yeah, it is just a normal one. But this is a page from the the editing of the book. So it sort of makes sense. Um, so yeah, I don't have anything else to add to this except it's, it's, it's fine. I don't, I'm going to try and read more poetry and try and try and get it a little bit more, but I mean, it's interesting to think about. I think that conceptually poetry is, is more interesting to me than the actual process of, of reading it. There are people out there that are listening to this who are poets are flipping out. By the way. Yeah. I'm just going to listen to this and probably flip out. Um, so I just, very random aside, tried to Google uh, P.O.L. covers, and I put the periods in there. It, it suggested that I look for pool covers instead. Of course. Because, <laughs> you know, I have a pool. Um, <laughs> anything oh, else man. happening in the uh, world of uh, publishing and publishing translations and all of that? I wish we uh, be aware of. Jesus, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> 
I feel pretty out of it, like disconnected from everything. Um, I was yeah, looking. I know what you mean. I was looking through Publishers Weekly right before he called, and there's nothing interesting in here that 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 had anything. But um, there was. I went to a festival. I went to the 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 German New German Literature Festival. Okay. That was the thing. Um, it was fine. Good. Good. It was. There's there were a couple of nice people there that that a couple of really interesting authors were there. But one of the things, and this is. All the Germans listening to this are going to flip out now. So, I mean, whatever. Fuck it. Um, they called it, uh, the, t- the topic was seriously funny. And it was supposed to be like, you know, about kind of at least somewhat the humor in, in German and Austrian Swiss writing. And there was one book that was sort of funny. But for the most part, like, it's just not funny. They had, they had a whole reading in which it went on for like maybe an hour before there was a laugh. <laughs> not, not good. Not, not, a, not the ideal situation for that yeah and i also like I'll, I'll go on record as saying this i don't think i like um daniel kelman's books <laughs> at all oh god i can't even remember the name of the one i read that's I, how much i it like made no impact on me i listened to the audiobook of f his most recent one um before going to the the festival because i knew he was going to be there and i thought well you know whatever i'll give it another chance and i listened to it and his a pile of garbage and then when i was there i read an interview or a review of uh fake the earlier book that was in the new york times that just slaughtered it (laughs) and it's it's an incredibly funny incredibly funny um review that just like takes it apart so uh that that he was there so there's that, but it was it was a decent festival. It's, they they do a nice job of like putting together and bringing bringing a bunch of writers together. A couple of my students came down with me, and one of them was very thrilled because there's a Swiss German writer there, and there's not a lot of Swiss German writing. It's like more of a, a oral language. So there's like a couple of presses that are doing that are printing books in the Swiss German dialect versus like standard German, which generally speaking, Swiss German authors seem to have been writing in or being published in. Um, so that was kind of curious. I, I mean, I've heard people speak it before, but I couldn't tell you that I know nothing about the German language. So I don't either. It's, I mean, the way you described it and the way that they were talking, it's a lot more sing-songy. Okay, sure. And 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 specific. And I guess I, that my students from that area, so he that's um, the way he grew up speaking. So that was cool, and it was a nice. It was a very nice event. Oh, uh, the pen pen translation. Oh shit! That's right. That happened. That happened. I'm sorry you didn't win. Yeah, well, I mean, we all knew it was going to win. It wasn't very... I, I saw the thing. I was like, well, that's that's the least interesting thing that happened this morning. Yeah. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, it was the Lispector um, that won, which is good for the book. Um, I really wish it sold more copies. Uh, I, it's really great for the translator. I'm, I'm really glad she won the award, but um, yeah, it's probably not going to move too many books. Oh. Um, yeah, but it's still like it's 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 important to win things and feel yes, feel good about having the, accomplished things. Yes, absolutely, uh, and, that's, and that's cool. I haven't read that book because I read too many of the the collections before, so I just didn't haven't gotten into it. Now that I no longer work at New Directions, um, I am going to go on record as saying I am not a big fan of uh, the Resale Inspector. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> we're, we're we're just. I think the second half of the, the first half of this is like, wow, we really love this book. Then the next part is like, we don't understand poetry. And the third part is, here are people we don't like. <laughs> so, I look. I like some of her books. I just. There are others where I just find them incredibly um, oppressive in a way that I don't enjoy. Uh, uh, I totally understand why people love her, and it's th- th- the same reasons those people love her. I dislike. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's like me and Guns and Roses. Sure, just like that. <laughs> but I mean, every time I've explained why I don't like Guns and Roses, people are like, "But that's why we like them." Like that that vibe. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Fair. <laughs> that, that that's the, yeah. It's just like a, a very like you understand it. You just. To have the opposite opinion of whether that thing is something you like or not, or is good or not. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I like some of her books more than others too. I haven't read. I really love *Hour of the Star*. I really yeah. think that's like amazing. I liked *Near to the Wild Heart*, but like *The Passion According to G.H.*. No, I didn't I... enjoy that book at all. <laughs> not at all. That is very oppressive. Yeah, and just like I remember telling Barbara that I didn't like it, and she's like. What are you not interested in the self? And I was like, no, that's exactly it. I am not interested in myself. <laughs> like, I don't want to read about myself. Oh man. <laughs> oh, man. 
<laughs> Which, hey, look, there are people who like that. That's fine. Um, do you have a rant, Brave? No, but one other thing before we do that. So the the next reading the world book, or the reading the world book club books, um, we put up a long time ago. When I first started this, it picked like four months of stuff with the hopes that we would be able to get things going and then like have people vote on stuff and see if people would uh want to join in and god knows how this is working or not but I, I don't mind reading a book each month and like sort of going through it um and it kind of keeps me on track makes me feel sort of human so in march um the book that we're supposed to read this month is the vegetarian by han kang which is translated from the korean by deborah smith and is available now from hogarth i have the british edition which i read last year and i'm not going to reread that so this is going to be one of those where like if you read it which i know you have some feelings that you may or may not like this book in the end um, if you read it, eh, the whole thing, and we talk about it, this is going to be the one where you're like saying things. I'm like, I kind of vaguely remember that. Like, I think, I think that thing happened. Didn't this thing happen too? I mean, I remember basically the bigger problem is that the March book that was supposed to be for poetry was days when I hide my corpse in a cre- cardboard box because I liked that title by Natalia Chan translated by Eleanor Goodman. That book has been delayed by Zephyr Press. So it is not available until, until April. So I vote that we just shipped in there instead, and I'll put this on the website before this podcast even goes up, the Rocio Cerrone book, um, Diorama, which won the Best Translated Book Award last year. And since the Best Translated Book Award stuff is really about to ramp up, like, hardcore, with a long list in, like, three weeks or whatever, um, it seems like a good idea to read that, that poetry book now. Yes. Um, you should probably, we should probably get this podcast up uh, fairly quickly if we're going to, you know. Also, I guess you're going to put that on the website. But yeah, yeah, I'll put that on the website tomorrow. Seven. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I didn't realize that it's already the 7th. That's weird. I guess it's because, yeah, last week started on Tuesday. Stupid February. Too short. Um, vegetarian super fast and super short. It's like 150 pages, I think, maximum. Maybe not, but it's it's pretty short. And then uh, uh, the Cerrone book, I don't know how long that is, but it's poetry, you know. <laughs> it's, like, it's like 15, 20 minutes. Reading. One subway ride. It's a subway. <laughs> it's a subway. <laughs> to make fun of someone else. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, yeah, and then if, are there any books that – so you have something for, for April on here for both of them i might just move down the the poetry book down to april and then um this horses horses and the end the light remains pure about uh japanese um uh earthquake and accidents all that stuff um so you have those but then we didn't have anything for may or onwards i thought from may we could put up something with like a few choices that people could vote on are there any books that you want to throw in the throw in there i was mostly choosing ones that were relatively or like immediately new when i was going through this just for the fact that then bookstores would have them and when? if bookstores got on board with this and wanted to, like, you know, display them or, like, encourage people to buy them based on the fact that they could talk about it online and hear a podcast about it and, and all that kind of stuff, that that would be awesome. Um, I don't know if anyone's doing that, but uh, – so I don't know that it has to be, like, immediately as, – as immediate as the ones I was picking on here, although it is kind of fun to read new books. But I don't know if you have anything that you wanted to throw in there. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, um, but I'm curious, when is your – Argentine writer who I'm, whose name I'm totally going to forget. The one that I said you'd like, Gessel Dome? Yeah. Yes. Gessel. August. August. Yep. I have two proposals. I would love to do that in August because that looks awesome. Have you sent me awesome. a of that already? Is that possible? Nope. We just sent it off to the printer. I might have sent you a PDF, but I don't think you'd want to read that. But we just sent it off to the printer today. Oh, okay. So it'll be, it'll be in shortly. Um, but for – I'm going to put this online too, but for June, I think um, – I, I, what I would like to do for this, which is which is obnoxious, but I think would be sort of interesting, maybe if anyone else agrees, or at least make this one of the options people can vote for. But I just got in from Yale the translation of Graveyard Clay, which is the new translation of The Dirty Dust, the Irish book that I thought was so funny last year. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to have this be these two versions be one of the book club books to see what people which one they read and what their reactions are and what the similarities differences are. We should each read a different one. Yeah, exactly. That's what we should do. And I think that would be kind of cool. Because yeah, it is yeah, such a June. bizarre thing. When is uh, Bloom's Day? June, right? Yep, June 16th. All right. Done. So it's June is pencil then. Okay, and then, and, we, and then we have August. And I'll figure out some other ones in the middle. But I did have a, I did have a, ray, or a rant 
but I, I can't find it now. But I had seen this thing. This was weeks ago, like right after we did our last podcast, where I saw this thing that I think it was in New Hampshire, but it might have been um, Delaware. I think it was Delaware. Um, was it the Shirtless Book Club? No, but that's awesome. You need to <laughs> you talk about that while I try and find this. So apparently this actor in L.A., obviously, I don't, it's redundant mentioning that fact, Ben Bauer uh, has this thing called Shirtless Dudes Book Club in which he takes off his shirt and talks about books. Um, which <laughs> I think there's probably some people out there who would, who would prefer if you did this one shirtless, Tom. Uh, yeah. I, uh, no. No. So, I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to play them because I'm, I'm afraid the audio is just going to be awful. But if you, I, I will, I've sent you this link yeah. to you again, but just, just know that this exists. So this is neither a rant nor a rave. It's just, just the thing that exists. That is, isn't neither a rant nor a rave either. It's just something curious as I saw and I found it. So in Delaware, they, there was an auction in which someone paid $325,000 for a license plate number 14 because, quote, it's a prestigious thing attached to license plates that have very low numbers in Delaware. And this... I'm aware of this. Yes, go on. So, yeah, so they paid $325,000 for this one license plate just for the number 14, which is, which is insane. But nine years ago, someone paid $675,000 for number six. So if you're slotting that together, you can, yeah, that's, they're pretty far away from being number six. I don't think their 14 is very prestigious at all anymore. No, they double digits. So. Yeah, that's, that's bullshit. $325,000, they overpaid for that. Um, so I Why is this a thing? I have no idea. It, it's always people who have, like, you know, refurbished Model Ts or something, too. It's just so ridiculous. Everything's stupid. <laughs> Um, so I have a rave. I was uh, reading the New York Times Magazine yesterday and uh, very happily came across an article by our friend Mark Benelli. Oh, really? Have you read this yet? No. It's called Ten Shots Across the Border, uh, and the subtitle is The Killing of a Mexican 16-Year-Old Raises Troubling Questions About the United States Border Patrol. To give you a very quick summary of the f- basic facts of the story, a... Um, a 16-year-old boy on the Mexican side of Nogales, which is called Nogales in Mexico and is a much larger city than the Nogales on the in Arizona. Arizona side of the border. And apparently there's just a tall fence, but it's not really a fence. It's slats, so there are like three-inch gaps in between so that the Border Patrol agents can see what's going on on the other side. Um so a Border Patrol agent uh, following a, a sort of um, incident with some drug runners climbing the wall, dropping off some drugs, and then climbing back over the wall. During this incident, you know, in the middle of the night, shot and killed a 16-year-old boy who was doing literally nothing but, like, walking down the street on the other, on the other side of the border. So through the fence, a wow. U.S. Border Patrol agent shot and killed an innocent 16-year-old boy. So the article is basically about, one, like, what is jurisdiction in this situation? What, what, where does the Constitution fall on this? Et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a, a lot of what Mark investigates. And then secondly, um, the lack of oversight that the Border Patrol um, has been subjected to because they aren't a police force. They're a federal agency and all of the sort of nonsense that goes along with that. Very, very well researched. Um, he did a lot of interviews. There are a lot of fucking acronyms, but um, that's what you get when you deal with the U.S. government. It's yet another horrifying aspect of you know what's going on along the border. Um, most of it instigated by us, but uh, very well written, very well done by Mark. So go and read that. There's also um, some really cool photos about the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and it's there's hold on, I got to find the exact wording. Let's see what it says here. Because it's got, um, there's like an uh, ad for the stupid, all right, here it is. View the scene of the shooting experience, Ambos Nogales, uh, which is, uh, what the fuck does Ambos stand for? Ambos. Shade? Shadow? No. Oh, um, twin? What the fuck does Ambos stand for? It explained that. Both. Experience 
Ambos Nogales in a new virtual reality film that examines Jose Antonio, that's the kid who was shot, a uh, case from both sides of the fence. The film is in the New York Times VR app, available for free in Apple's App Store and Google Play. <laughs> yep, they have a link to that here online, too. Which, I don't know if you know what this is, but I got this these um, this VR, virtual reality sort of um, glasses thing with my New York Times delivered one Sunday. Are you serious? Yeah, and it was like this cardboard box that I had to put together, and then I was supposed to slide my iPhone into it, download this app, and then through that I would be able to like wear this thing, like a virtual reality thing, watch this video, and somehow experience something. And as soon as I felt like I put it all together and I was like, oh, cool. And then I had to like download an app and log in. And I was like, fuck this. I'm never yeah, doing it. No. So I discarded the cardboard box that served as the whole thing. <laughs> so I can't participate, unfortunately. I'm but sure you, I'm you don't need the cool. box, though, do you? You can just put the app. You can just hold your phone. I feel like you need the – it's got it's like 3D glass kind of thing. Yeah, but I think, I think, it's, I think the box is just putting the, holding the phone for you so that you didn't have to hold it with your hands. And it would block out the light and everything. No, I feel like there's actually like something in like the the lenses that you're looking through that makes it virtual reality as opposed to just like a, a shitty app. I'm gonna I'm downloading this thing. I'm gonna find out. You get to the bottom of it. I mean, I'm gonna try and uh, try and do this virtual reality thing because I'm yeah because I'm hip like that <laughs> into, into into virtual reality and technology and stuff. Not really. That's that's awesome. I love. I, I, it seems like Mark's doing more um, political things, especially for the New York Times magazine. Yes, there's the uh, super prison, supermax prison one. Yeah, um, I know that when I was in New York, he was in South Carolina at the Democratic uh, election primary election. Oh, I don't know okay. what that's for, but he was down there. Um, um, apparently, his new novel is coming out. Yeah, does, actually, when does that it just come says, out? It just, uh, oh, May. Dude, we got to have him on when that comes out. <clears throat> Screaming Jay Hawkins all time greatest hits. May. Yep. Anyway, Howard. all right, I gotta get going. Okay, sounds good. I have, I have no raves, anyways, except that college basketball is about to kick into high gear, and I'm excited for that. I know nothing about college basketball this year. Oh, which I don't either, and it's making it amazing. <laughs> well, I'm gonna win all the tournaments, on. So <laughs> I'm sure. This works. But less you know. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'll talk to you later, man. Good luck. All right, thanks, bud. Nobody dies